All right, welcome back everybody. Today we're going to talk about what are called bony fish, and this is the class Osteichthyes. And the bony fish can be recognized by the bony endoskeleton, and some of them actually have a pair of lungs, uh, or they have a swim bladder, which is going to be more common in the fish that we discuss. And they have fins that have bony projections inside the fins. Unlike sharks, there's no placoid scales, but they may have either ganoid, tenoid, or cycloid scales. And scale names are based on shape and chemical structures and things of that sort. So that's how they come up with the names. The class Osteichthyes, and those are the class Sarcopterygii, which are the lobed fin fish, and the class Actopterygii, uh, and the Actopterygii are the ray fin fish. Now, you'll see here that I have class Osteichthyes and then two classes, Sarcopterygii and Actopterygii. Well, how do you have one class with two classes below it? Uh, what has happened recently is taxonomists have recently got rid of the class Osteichthyes and have elevated the other two groups to now classes. Uh, and what I'm doing here is basically stopping the end of that saying, no, I'm not going to let you get rid of class Osteichthyes. So I have class Osteichthyes because that's how I learned it, you know, for 40 years or so, and now they want to get rid of it, and, and I refuse. So I'm going to call it class Osteichthyes, and then the Sarcopterygii and the Actopterygii, I'm going to call those groups. And that is still a correct term, but it is much more general. And this kind of thing happens all the time in taxonomy, so this is really nothing new, but the taxonomy and the science of naming and classifying organisms is an ongoing science, and I would say 90% or more of the groups pretty much stay the same, but there are a couple groups, and the bony fish here is one of them, where they're always kind of moving it around and changing it, but these are really based on humans and us wanting to classify things a certain way and certain rules we've made, the fish are still there. Nothing's changed really with that. But how we interpret where we place them is more of kind of like a scientific political matter than it is a really pure science. Think about a little bit about basic anatomy of a bony fish. First, we already kind of did this with sharks and many of those same things apply. First of all, like sharks, they have this lateral line that goes along the sides, usually, of the animal. And these are a sensory organ to detect pressure changes, typically. Pressure changes come in the form of sound waves that would hit the fish. Bony fish have a swim bladder, which is not something we saw in sharks. The swim bladder, also called the gas bladder, has a, is a pocket of air that it can regulate and change the amount of air in, which changes then the pressure. And so depending on where the fish is, whether it's close to the surface or deeper, it can change the volume of air in there to adjust for the pressure and basically sit in the column of water at different depths without having to swim. Anterior and posterior dorsal fins, very much like we saw in the shark, and they have a homocercal caudal fin, which means that the caudal fin, the two lobes are about the same, different than what you saw in the heterocercal caudal fin of the sharks. Now, bony fish are actually a really big group, so there's a lot of different variations of the caudal fin, but most of them are gonna have a homocercal caudal fin. Here's a kind of a close-up look of what the lateral line system looks like. It's these sensitive pressure cups that have these microscopic hairs inside, and when water changes pressure, it pushes on this little cup called a cupule, and it changes the pressure inside there, activating the sensory cells that then send action potentials or nerve transmission to the fish's brain so it can feel basically what's uh, changing around its environment. All right, so now we'll talk about that group, Sarcopterygii. These are the coelacanths as one group. They have these three lobed caudal fins, which is unusual for basically any fish that's alive now. They have a very fleshy operculum. So instead of being a bony plate, it's actually kind of, uh, kind of softer and squishy. 
they have a jointed skull, and they are viviparous, they give live birth. They have an interesting structure on their face called a rostral organ, and that's an electroreceptive organ uh, located in the front of the brain case, and it's used for sensing uh, prey, like uh, electrical signals, kind of like the ampullae of Lorenzini found on sharks. They were thought to be extinct 65 million years ago, but in 1938, uh, some people fishing caught one of these and didn't know what it was. And since then, they occasionally catch them in the Indian Ocean. So there's populations of these near Indonesia and South Africa. The next group is the lungfish within that sarcopterygy. And I'm just gonna point out um, just the first two points here because these are freshwater fish. And since we're taking marine bio, we don't need to worry about all the fish. The reason I put these in here, these fish actually have lungs and they go up and they gulp air, so they breathe surface or atmospheric air. And I only point that out because what we're gonna do in marine bio is we're gonna kind of skip over the amphibians, but I wanna give you a little sense of the evolution of what'll be called tetrapods as we get there, because since we skip most of lungfish and the amphibians, it, there's a bit of like magic that'll appear when the reptiles start appearing in the ocean. So uh, we'll talk about that as we go. The last class, and again, I'm going to call this a group, Actinopterygy, and this contains 50% of all the vertebrates. So just this one group of these fish, 99% of all fish uh, total. So 50% of all vertebrates, 99% of all fish are just in this one group. 34,000 species, and this will be the topic of PLC number four as we talk a little bit about fish behavior or have you do that, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. I'll just give you some examples. Um, it's a really big group with lots of really neat adaptations, and so I'll mention a couple here, and then in PLC number four, you'll kind of show us some more. Uh, so first we have these, what are called flying fish, which we have occasionally off our coast here, and they have these modified pectoral fins, they swim really fast, jump out of the water, and then they extend these pectoral fins and they glide for up to about 45 seconds. And most of the time they get maybe 100 to 150 feet, but some of the longer records they've seen, some of these go, you know, 1300 feet gliding out of the water. And they use that behavior to escape uh, predators. So if a predator is chasing these fish, they can jump out of the water and, and basically land, you know, somewhere different. And, and if you're a predatory fish, having a fish leave the water and land somewhere else makes it difficult for them to catch. Then another example, uh, we have these, what we call, sometimes we call this a sex role reversal in terms of sexual strategy in males and in female um, mating behavior. Good examples of these are the seahorses and the leafy sea dragons, where the males have this, it's called a brood pouch. And so the males actually have a pouch where the eggs will develop and the females basically lay the eggs and the male does the parental care after that. And because of that, uh, they will sometimes say that the male is, you know, a pregnant male, um, which some sort of disagree. It's not exactly the same as, as um, a, a female reproductive strategy with a true placenta. But because of that, you see a very different uh, mating system than we see in almost every other species um, uh, of really anything. And often we'll call this a sex role reversal. Um, and what happens here is females, in this case, will compete for males and males are highly selective, which is opposite of how most uh, animal species are mating. So in this case, what they found is that the males are doing the selection, the females have to compete, and males, it turns out, like bigger females. Maybe they produce bigger eggs, or perhaps you know they produce more eggs. There's probably some reason behind it, but um, that's an example, another behavior example of what you find in ocean fish. Another example that I, I think you'll find interesting is we have uh, many different kinds of sex change, and and it can happen in different ways. And, and, and there, even after I'm done telling you this here uh, today, you'll have plenty of opportunities to, if you wanna pick one of these, um, there'll be plenty more examples you can use. So our state marine fish, the Girabali, this wonderful bright orange fish, if you ever can go out to Catalina Island, uh, which is right off our coast here, 
Uh, the water is really nice and clear and beautiful, and you can see these fish swimming uh, right off our coast. They, we have them locally here too as well, but you can see them better in Catalina, and they're this bright, vivid orange, and that is our state marine fish. And it's one type of fish that's capable of sex change. There's actually many. And sex change can happen where all the fish start as male and then later on turn into female. And then there's others that start as female and they could turn into males later on for different reasons. The Garibaldi is an interesting one because it has multiple sex changes throughout its life. So it can be male or female and then it can switch to being male or female later on. So multiple sex changes throughout its life, not just what we call se sequential hermaphroditism, which is where you go from one sex uh, to another sex in a kind of a linear fashion. Of course, not all fish undergo sex change like this, but a surprisingly good number of them do. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not just one or not just three or four. There's groups of them that do this. Okay, so I think that's a good place to stop. That'll be the end of fish. Next, we'll move into talking about tetrapods, and our first group of that will be reptiles.